uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Xian Tang. I'm a professor of uh, statistics at the uh, University of Michigan. And uh, this session uh, is organized by Ling Long Kong uh, from the University of Alberta. And uh, the session title is Functional and uh, Spatial Techniques in Neuroimaging Data. And uh, uh, we have uh, actually four speakers in this session, and uh, each speaker has 20 minutes to present. And uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, Michelle uh, Mirinda uh, from University of uh, Victoria. And uh, she will talk about the com uh, composite hybrid basis approach incorporating residual connectivity in fact fMRI data. Uh, can you share the screen? Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for having me uh, here. So in this talk, um, I will introduce the idea of a composite hybrid basis approach to analyze task fMRI data. So before I do that, I would like to start by talking about the task data. We'll be looking at data from the Human Connectome Project, HCP, which is an open source neuroimaging behavioral study with data from over 1,200 healthy young adults. It has a lot of data from different modalities, but we'll focus here on fMRI. So in addition to resting state data, we, uh, we have also test data from a variety of different tasks. There are basically three goals with the task data here. The first one is to find activation signatures. Uh, the second one is to characterize the functionally distinct nodes. And with these analysis, validate the outcomes of the connectivity analysis for resting state data. So these analysis combined are important because they will provide a more clear picture of brain function. So there are basically three types of task fMRI brain connectivity, the resting state connectivity, task-based connectivity, and background connectivity. I borrowed this terminology from Elk Hetali and other co-authors from a paper released in 2019 in neuroimaging, and they define background connectivity as task-dependent connection patterns that are due to variations in ongoing neural activity rather than stimulus-driven activity. So they also say that to optimally perform a task, the brain enters this task state. And there is a lot of evidence suggesting that maintaining these task states might be due to background connectivity. So our goal is then to propose a unifying framework for brain activation and background connectivity that accounts for local and global spatial correlation and flexibly captures potentially spatially varying temporal correlation. We also want to provide a full Bayesian inference in the whole brain space, estimate the patterns of connectivity, and explore background connectivity metrics across different ROIs. So we are going to, from all the tasks available at HCP, we are going to work with the working memory task, which consists of 405 um, volumes. Each volume is size 91 by 109 by 91. They are all normalized in MNI space. Each volunteer went through two, two runs in this task. The first run is the, a left to right, and the second one is a right to left phase encoding. Within each of those runs, half of the blocks used a two back working memory task and half used a zero back. So we are gonna look at only at the right to left phase encoding run here. So in the, in the two back task here shown on the right picture, uh, what the person has to do is that they have to press a button if the image that they are currently seeing is the same as two images ago. And in the zero back uh, image, they have to press a button if the image that they are currently seeing is the same as a target image. Uh, in a, in the, within this task, a component also consisting of four categories of pictures. There are faces, places, tools, and body parts was embedded within this working memory task. So this is the task data that we're gonna look at. So the data, because we have four different categories of images and the two back and zero back task, we have currently eight is stimulus to look at. In, on the right hand side here of this panel, we can see the stimulus indicators. They were already convoluted with the hemodynamic response function. And I have eight of those. 
And to the right of each one of those, I have the convolution of the stimulus indicator and the derivative of the hemodynamic response function. So uh, in a regular um, fMRI uh, analysis here. On the left-hand side, I just um, have a plane through the 3D brain data of the example subject that we are using here at time point uh, equals to one. So the first time point. So we can, there are many ways that we can analyze this data. The first, we can either ignore stimulus type and focus on memory load, or we can collapse across memory load and focus on stimulus comparisons between the image categories. Here, we are gonna focus on the contrast of faces versus places. There are many possibilities with all those eight uh, different types of stimulus. So how do we model activation? Now, the first simple model that we can think of is that we can look at the bold time series for each voxel, and we can model that where SJ is an indicator of stimulus J. H here is a hemodynamic response function, uh, and we, they can both be the A convolution of them can be evaluated at time T, we can have a random measurement error term. And then B BJ here is then just gonna characterize the relationship of brain activity during a stimulus J. But one question that we can ask ourselves is how can we account for the dependencies from the complex structure of the brain? One way that we can do that is by making assumptions on the noise, the measurement error structure here including the um, time dependencies, the spatial dependencies in there. If we want to use a Bayesian approach, we can also assume a spatial prior distribution for beta J, for each beta J. That's also a possibility. But it becomes very computationally intensive if we want to perform an MCMC and estimate those um, betas here for all single voxels. At the voxel level, it becomes very um, time consuming, especially if we want an algorithm that can scale up for multiple subjects. But we still want to account for the temporal structure. We also want to account for the spatial structure of the brain data. For that, we are gonna use a basis strategy that works in the fall. The following, the first step is to um, write the model in a matrix notation. So model one, we can write in a matrix notation. And now we are gonna define a set of basis function that I'm calling Xi. Xi is formed by theta and epsilon, two different bases here. Theta is what I'm gonna, what is gonna be my temporal basis and epsilon is gonna be my spatial basis. So we are gonna project both sides of equation two into this lower dimensional space and just by multiplying uh, of um, multiplying by those spatial bases and the temporal bases in the following way shown here in equation th three here. So xi, which is the set of basis functions, we will effectively provide a tensor time space basis representation for the volumetric 4D data. We also should choose Xi carefully so they can capture some key characteristics of the data. Uh, so in the case of fMRI data, we want it to capture the spatial structure and we also want, it, we want Xi to capture the temporal structure. For the fMRI data, we are gonna choose uh, the epsilon here to represent the spatial basis and theta to represent the temporal basis. For the temporal basis, we are gonna use a wavelet basis that it's, it's uh, with a long memory structure that I'm comment later on. And for epsilon, we are gonna use what we call, and we want to introduce the concept of a composite hybrid basis. So what is a composite hybrid basis? Uh, in this particular case, our composite hybrid, we have two components. One component is gonna account for nearby correlations and another component is going to account for distant spatial correlations. So epsilon here is going to be phi times psi where phi accounts for local spatial dependencies and psi accounts for global spatial dependencies. I'm gonna explain briefly what they mean without getting into too many details here. So the, the spatial basis is gonna be divided into those two components. The psi component is going to account for local spatial correlations. And the way we do that is by first dividing the brain into smaller clusters, so into K clusters here. In each of those clusters, we extract features by projecting into the principal components of that particular region that we are calling way K star here, or YK star here. 
So K, um, I have um, a total of K of, of um, capital K uh, regions of interest that I or clusters that I divide my brain. Those can be anything. For this particular application, we are going to use the Telerac Atlas with 298 uh, regions of interest, but anything can be used to divide the brain into smaller clusters. So within each of those clusters, I extract local features. Those local features, I'm calling them Y star K. And then I'm gonna collapse all this information into a matrix Y star. So Y star now is my matrix of local features. Next step on the, still on the spatial basis is to project this matrix of local spatial features into a matrix that contains information for the whole brain. And the way we do that is by projecting Y star into what we call the Y double star, which is just a projection of the original Y star into the space of principal components. So now I have data that was projected kind of sequentially twice. And to account for the temporal correlation, as I mentioned before, we are going to assume that theta is a discrete wavelet transform. So the ideas for the discrete wavelet transform are similar to um, the papers uh, published by Zhang and co-authors in 2014. So our original data, Y, now was projected on both sides in the spatial domain and, then, and uh, to account for the spatial structure and also to account for the temporal structure. And this transformed data that is now that now lays in this lower dimensional space, I'm going to call YW. So why do we do that? First, because we can reduce a lot of the data dimensionality by doing that, it's still accounting for the local and global structure of the data. We can also account for temporal structure of the data in a much lower dimensional space. It's easier to make assumptions in this lower dimensional space because if we project using principal components and wavelets, uh, there is a lot of decorrelation that occurs in the process. So assumptions of independence, for example, are, um, are acceptable in this lower dimensional space. So all the model assumptions are done in the basis space. We assume a long memory structure for the error component here in the model. We can use an inverse of all those projection matrix to project back into the original data space. And I'm not, not going to enter into the details of, of the assumptions here. But one thing that it's important to notice is, is even though we assume independence in the wavelet space, these, in the, these components um, that we can estimate in the wavelet space, they will induce a long memory temporal correlation in the space of the global features. See, because each spatial basis has their own variance component, the temporal correlation is allowed to vary spatially, but it's still borrow um, strength across voxels and according to the induced correlation structure of the spatial basis. This induced correlation in the space of Y double star also induces a background correlation in the space of Y star, and that will allow us to estimate background connectivity. We ran the model using an MCMC algorithm. We can estimate the components and we can project back the computational time divided by each component is given by this table here. So it takes about 11 minutes to run a full Bayesian inference for the whole brain in this um, test data. So next we are gonna compare this composite hybrid basis approach with four other models. Um, so A here is just gonna denote the composite hybrid spatial basis. That means that for Upsilon, which is my spatial basis, I have the composite hybrid, and I still have, have wavelet in time. B is going to have a local basis for the spatial basis, just dividing the brain into smaller clusters and projecting in, in each region, but without doing the second step in wavelet in time. The third model that we're going to look at is the global spatial basis. That means I'm only taking epsilon to be the principal components in the whole brain without dividing in smaller clusters before and wavelet in time. The fourth model is a no spatial basis model with wavelet in time. And the last model is just an SPM with uh, the statistical parametric map uh, results with an AR1 processing time. 
For inference, we are going to consider the joint bands given um, more details can be found here in this paper from 2015, and they will control for the multiple testing in an experiment-wise manner. Here are some of the results for the contrast between faces versus places. So this is just for activation for now. Uh, on the left-hand side, I have the posterior mean of the contrasts, and on the right-hand side, I have the significance based on those simultaneous band scores. And if you look at the, uh, the left-hand side, you can see that there are not that many, not much difference we can notice from, from the contrast um, here. So the posterior mean of the contrast is very similar among all those models. The SPM produces results that are slightly different from all the other ones, but overall pretty similar. But when we look at detection, we notice that both models A and B, and those are the models that include local bases, are the ones with the higher detection power. So just here, just the same results. Remember that A includes the local basis. First one is the composite hybrid. The second one is just local basis. The third one is just the principal components in the spatial domain. The, the fourth one is just a no basis approach for the spatial domain, but still wavelet in time. And the last one is SPM. So we can see that the results for A and B, the composite hybrid and the local basis are very similar here. One thing that it's also important to notice is that the interval width, which is given by the simultaneous band score and average across voxels here, is smaller when we look at the composite hybrid approach compared to all the other ones. So you can ask, you can ask us, okay, so you have a good power to detect, but what about the false discovery rates? We actually ran a simulation study and we found that the proposal methodology does not increase the false discovery rate, which was a good result. We also were able to capture through background connectivity and we don't capture spurious background connectivity. So the basis is strategy work here. But what about background connectivity? We found a lot of background connectivity when we look at the ROI connectivity. Uh, the way we did that is by using the square root of the RV coefficient. So the RV coefficient is talked about in this paper team uh, and, and co-authors from 2020. It's just a single value across dependence measure for the linear dependence between those components. And I just reordered them here on the right-hand side so we can see that there is clearly um, background connectivity happening here during this task. So if I zoom in and look at only the pairs that have a higher connectivity, so connectivity above 0.7, for example, uh, I can come up with 26 pairs, and this is the matrix of the, the new connectivities from the highest um, pairs that I, that I found. The labels on the both X and Y are related to the Tylerac atlas that I used to divide the brain first. I don't have all the pairs listed here, but I have the ones with the highest connectivity. Connectivity is above 0.8. The, they are indicated here and the labels that they correspond to in the brain, they are shown on this table here. There is also a, a good way to represent this data is just by looking at this picture here. With, represent, well, with the representation of the background connectivity. The interesting thing about this picture is that even though when we look at activation patterns, uh, we saw a lot of things happening in the occipital lobe, which is expected because that's where the visual cortex is and they are looking at images. But here we see connections in the frontal lobe and the occipital lobe, which, and, and, and it's interesting because we know that the frontal lobe is responsible for, for tasks that involve um, uh, cognition and uh, short-term memory, tasks that involve um, a lot of the cognitive tasks are uh, done here in the frontal lobe. So there is clearly a connection with the frontal lobe and the visual cortex and in the occipital lobe here. So that's uh, quite interesting to see. So the conclusions that we can, um, for now, that we can say is that there is an, a significantly increase of the statistical power when we use the composite hybrid basis approach, also with the local approach. So the spatial basis is a good strategy. When we account for local spatial information, we find a great improvement in detection power. 
The composite hybrid approach with both local and global spatial bases has the smallest joint bands. Uh, this approach is, it's, is incorporates somehow the background uh, connectivity into the estimation procedure. So it allows us to take a look at the background connectivity and maybe gain insights of what's happening in the brain. The strategy, even though, so right now we only look at the subjective specific activation here just for one subject, the example subject in HCP data, we can perform in multiple subjects by doing the subject specific analysis individually and then um, find a, a, a performing a group level analysis that can be done in both activation and the background connectivity as well. So I know this was um, really fast, but that's all I have to talk about. <laughs> and thank you. If you have any questions, please um, let me know. So our next speaker is uh, Jing Yu Zheng uh, from Auburn University. She's going to talk about uh, the time frequency uh, spectral analysis of SCOP EEG signals using empirical mode decomposition. OK, thank you, Dr. Kao. Let me share my screen really quick. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Cool. OK, let me get started. So hi everyone, I'm Ginny from Auburn University and today I'm going to briefly talk about time frequency spectral analysis of scalp EEG data. So I will start with a really brief overview of the EEG data and what methods people are usually used to handle EEG data. So EEG data is an electrophysiological and non-invasive monitoring methods that has been widely applied in neuroscience fields. It records electrical activity of the brain and it has been an excellent tool for studying the neural oscillations. There are studies and evidence has shown that the neural oscillations are robustly connected to behaviors such as epilepsy, sleep, emotion, and memory performance. That's why the neuroscience have been using that EEG for a lot of cases. So lots of researchers have been studying EEG data from different perspectives. So at the beginning, they're looking at the EEG data from the time domain, for, for instance, studying epilepsy, because for epilepsy, you can be able to see the big spike in the EEG signal in the time domain. And later on, people are trying to um, study the frequency domain, for instance, using Fourier transform um, to look at the frequency si signature. And later on, people are finding that if we combine time and frequency domain together, we're gonna have more information. Then they are using something like a Wibler transform, Hilbert Horn transform, or other kind of, or short Fourier transform, different kind of methods to study the time frequency domain. Of course, there are lots of other methods that people usually use, like linear nonlinear approaches, such as um, functional data analysis. And recently, people are using topological data analysis to handle EEG data. While there are lots of research, researchers have been studying EEG, but there are um, still challenges. So the biggest one, or I would say the, um, the first one that comes to my mind is that the EEG data is non-stationary and non-linear signals, which um, makes some methods like Fourier transform um, not that quite robust because um, the, um, the Fourier transform is usually used for stationary signals. So this is the, um, the first challenge that we have. And the second one um, I would say is that the neuroscientists, they usually require a predefined frequency bands. For instance, this is the canonical um, way to define this frequency band is the delta wave is usually frequencies between one to four hertz, theta is between four to eight hertz, alpha is eight to 12, beta is 12 to 30, low gamma is 30 to 60. Well, different researchers might um, use this um, predefined frequency bands a little bit different. For instance, some people use um, 0.5 to three hertz as delta waves, but they're pretty much the same. While this, um, has been widely used, but there's also a problem because um, there are variations between species in those frequency bands. For instance, um, Jacob has a study in 2014 saying that the movement related data in human hippocampus is one to four hertz, but in rats it's four to seven hertz. And there are also variations within species. For instance, there are differences in peak frequency. So there are two or, or, or more studies actually. So Hashmi actually um, claimed that for the peak alpha frequency can shift 
throughout the development of adulthood. And Furman has a study um, that saying that we can use the differences in peak frequency to discriminate the sensitivity level to pain for individuals. So this caused some problems if we're gonna use the um, predefined and a fixed frequency band for different subjects and of course for different species. So the third, or, or I should, the next um, challenge is that there is no rule of thumb features that, or, or the metrics that people um, adapt or, or, or think is the best. Um, some researchers use statistics like max minimum value, standard deviation, IQR, those values for um, transformed data or sometimes the raw data itself. Um, something like special, SPD, spectral power density, and people use that a lot. But there's no rule of something that, that can be uh, applied for um, most cases. And the last one is that there are high intersubject variability due to physiological differences between individuals. So um, considering those challenges, uh, we're gonna briefly discuss um, our approach to handle those EEG data. So let's start with looking at different data sets that we have in hand that we develop and validate our models. So the first one is the SCALP EEG data sets that from Human Special Cognition Lab from University of Arizona. So the left panel shows the front and back of the wireless EEG recording system and a couple with a immersive virtual reality set and an omnidirectional treadmill. The right panel here is a snapshot of the virtual environment that we use in the study. So in this experiment, we're asked the participants to conduct four different tasks. For each task, the participant is going to constantly do one um, movement while switching between two different um, other movements. For instance, for task one, the participant keeps their eyes open all the time while they switch between moving and standing still, each for 30 seconds, and there is a beat to remind them. So for example, for task three, the participant is moving all the time while they're switching between eyes open and closed, each for five seconds, and there's a beat to remind those. So the EG recorded are uh, the EG are recorded from the 64 channels. Here is the location. That's pretty uh, standard, honestly. And for the neuroscience for our collaborators, what they do is they have this regional interest, only two, so front and um, the occipital clusters, and they are just summarizing the information within each cluster and just do a simple test sort of things to test their hypothesis. And later on, we're gonna illustrate how we um, handle that. So the second data set we have is also from the same lab, but they're running a different task. This one is about a spatial teleportation task and we're showing the virtual reality setup. So the, the purpose of introducing the second data set is because this one has more um, trials for each individual. Well, in the results, you're gonna notice that for the first study, we actually only have 10 to 20 trials for each subject, which is sort of like a small data set. And for this one, we have double, almost like we have 50, um, uh, around 50 trials for each individual, and we have 19 individuals. So some methods works for on this case, and some like different models did not work on the previous one. Anyway, so. This one, um, in short, is the participant is trying to diagnose or to differentiate long versus short distance um, from um, the, their, end point, their enter point to their exit point. So here we have two uh, different kind of um, teleporters. So one is the short distance, one is the long distance, and the center is the exit. So we're um, asking the participant to go to different stores, target stores on arms, indicating um, if they're thinking that there's a long or versus a short teleporter. So the panel B here shows the uh, virtual reality settings. And this is the virtual city, the, the virtual settings, the participant thing, and this is um, the equipment, the um, omnidirectional and the virtual reality sets. So here is the typical uh, panel C, is a typical trial in the spatial distance task where the participants it either try traverse a short versus a long distance while we keep the time as a constant because we don't want to add any, any component vectors there. So this is a setting of the second uh, EG data. We also um, do another one. So the purpose of this one is because the signal is from a machine. So it's, this one is more like a 
stationary signals, different from EEG, which is a non-stationary signals. We also want to see if our methods works on this kind of data set as well. So this one is about anomaly detection, where we have the, um, so the left panel A and B shows the final product. And this has to go through a, so these two copper wafers are polished on a chemical mechanical polishing machine. We just call it CMP machine. And they ended up having different surface finished. So A is a success, B is a failure, just in short. So this one has a shiny and smooth surface, while for B, we can see some minor scratches and some burnt areas on the surface. We want to prevent this from happening when um, along the process, not like wait until we have the final product. So there are some CSP wireless vibration sensor installed so that we can look at their signals to diagnose if there's any anomaly happens along the time. So the panel A here shows an easy case, meaning that if you look and look at the shift, the main shift, there is a, a quite a obvious shift where we can use that to identify um, anomaly, which is the power, some kind of anomaly. But for panel B here, it's going to be hard to look at anomalies only in time domain because um, there's not obvious differences. So this one is a slurry shut off. It's not a kind of anomaly. Um, so this is another data set. So next one, we're going to um, come into the main methods that we're using. So um, the, uh, there are lots of different kind of transformation methods. So Hilbert Huang transform is just one of them. And it's, it has lots of variations in sort of advanced version of it, which we're actually uh, testing uh, different kind of versions. In this one, we just show one kind of, which is the original one, the empirical mode decomposition plus Hilbert, uh, Hilbert transform, which is two component of Hilbert Huang transform. So the EMD is a highly adaptive decomposition method. It is suitable for any signals, especially for non-stationary and non-linear signals. This is the main reason how we are choosing to use this one versus different kind of um, methods. So basically, in short, it decomposes the signal into a set of IMFs, which can be defined by two criteria. Mainly is symmetric and mean zero of the signal, so something like that. And the IMFs can form a complete adaptive and nearly orthogonal basis for the raw signals. It's, it's been hard to theoretically prove it's orthogonal, but like Huang mentioned in his paper, that this is not nearly orthogonal basis. So due to the time constraint, I'm going to just quickly go over the sifting process that how can get IMFs. So here I simulated a signal that's composed of one and four hertz signals. So go through the sifting process, which mainly just capturing the local minimum, local maximum, and line them up by spline and calculate the mean function and take it out. So if you look at the um, the one sub-signals, if this looks pretty much symmetric, uh, will satisfy two conditions. Like for this one, we'll say this one is first IMF, which mainly capture the four hertz signals. And you take this out to use the residual as the go back to the input and then repeat the sifting process, you're gonna get the second IMF, which is mainly the one hertz signals. But here we notice there are some boundary effects, which will be captured by IMF3 in the residual part. So this is a really brief introduction on how it works. So if you put all these IMFs and the residuals together, you're gonna have the raw signals back. And here we just show the first five IMFs that would decompose from the raw EG signals, because mainly because for the rest IMF is mainly signals of lower than 0.5 Hertz, which is not our interest. So the next step, once we have those IMFs, those sub-signals, we're gonna apply Hilbert transform on each of those sub-signals instead of the raw signals. This is the main difference. So here we're transform is well known. So using this, the purpose is just getting the instantaneous frequency and amplitude. By doing so, we can have this representation, which can be viewed as a generalized for a transform. If you compare this versus this guy over here, it can be seen that um, it's a generalized for a transform version lifting the restriction of constant frequency and amplitude. So the AI and omega I here are constant for Fourier transform. But for Hilbert Huang transform, for HHT, we are just having a function of time. So the instantaneous frequency and amplitude, they are all function of time. That's why HHT can explain the nonlinearity and non-linearity of the signal more efficiently and, and more flexible. flexible. So 
Here we're showing the um, Huber spectrum of the first four IMFs, which we're trying to use those to represent four different bird waves. And you notice that, you know, different um, instantaneous frequency gonna have a range of um, frequency, which there is a little bit of overlap. This is only for one trial. The interesting thing is that if you look at this representation across different kind of trials. So here we're showing the first IMF, the Huber spectrum, across two different um, movements or very input. We can observe similar stuff for uh, walking with standing still or eyes open or eyes closed. So here we're just showing five second eyes closed, eyes open. And we notice that instantaneous frequency sort of has a shift and the same for instantaneous amplitude. And this is the interesting part that we are trying to capture in the later analysis because this can be used to test the hypothesis that the neuroscientist is suspecting, or we can use that to build the classifiers to differentiate to different tasks. So the goal of the next you know, analysis is trying to capture this kind of uh, changes. So to start with that, the first step we have is trying to have a way to segment the frequency domain into a different frequency band. Like we discussed before, um, there is a canonical choice that people are usually use that, that is fixed for um, different subject for, you know, uh, for, for, for all people, which is stated over here. We are here, here we have delta, theta, alpha, beta waves. But like we discussed, there are um, differences among those um, within and across species. And there are high variations, you know, high interest variations. That's why we're considering to have a data-driven way to have a segmentation for each individual separately. So in short, how we do that, we just look at the empirical distribution of instantaneous frequency, for example, like this. This is just one illustration. In order to have, um, nearly zero overlappings. We're looking at, you know, using the uh, interval of one standard deviation, and we're looking um, averaging across all the trials for each individual. And here, the right panel here summarizing the um, data-driven segmentation for all the 16 participants we're having. And the dashed line here indicating the canonical, which is this uh, segmentation, this bands over here. And we can see that the um, segmentation pretty much matches the overall pattern of the canonical um, choice, but there, there are some differences for each individual compared with the canonical ones. So once we have the segmentation, we are considering some metric that we are trying to use to capture the differences um, across different trials. So the first one we propose is to try to summarize the frequency signature of the, um, the Hilbert spectrum which we are considering for the, the R1 to RS is the segmentation of the frequency domain. And we're basically calculating the proportion of the um, time points that when the instantaneous frequency are located in each frequency band. And the same thing for, um, for the amplitude signatures, different from the PSD that actually use an integral. Here, we're just taking the mean, using the mean of the instantaneous amplitude which we actually express it as a function of instantaneous frequency and time. So we look at the, so we gather around the frequency, the amplitude that the corresponding instantaneous frequency are located within the instantaneous, within each range of the band. And we take average of those instantaneous amplitude. So the goal of summarizing the Hilbert spectrum in those uh, two kind of metric is one hoping that we can use that to help the neuroscientist to um, test their hypothesis, not just using those as classification um, features. So here is just one example of how we can use those to help the neuroscientists test their hypothesis. So one hypothesis they want to test is if alpha waves is suppressed with visual input. Uh, with visual input means that uh, the eyes are open. So the key or the first question is how are we going to have a way to define the power of alpha waves? If you're thinking about the alpha waves, we know that alpha wave is a frequency between eight to 12, uh, eight to 12 or 14 hertz, which is, you have a range. If you have, want to have a way to measure the power of alpha waves, one option is that you just um, sample some frequencies within this range because there are actually unlimited uh, frequencies within this range. 
So one way people do, like my collaborator do, is they sample 10 or a couple of frequencies within this range. And for each frequency, they calculate the, the PSD separately. And then they just do the multiple testing together. And here, what we're trying to see is that you can use one of the, uh, the, the amplitude features that we propose to actually capture the power of alpha waves. So here, we're showing that the um, distribution of the um, alpha powers when eyes are open versus eyes are closed. And it's pretty clear that we can see that um, for this blue or purple, um, our full eyes are open, which is with visual input. And the power of this alpha wave is actually depressed. It's less than the other case. This is for one channel. We actually do that for all the channels. Oh, this is for channels. For two different tasks, tasks where the difference is, is that the participants keeps moving all the time. For task three, while they switch between eyes open and closed. And this for task four, they're standing still all the time. And if you, if you compare the two results for two different tasks, we can finally conclude that the posterior, which is this um, occipital areas, the posterior alpha oscillations are suppressed with viral input and it's also independent of movements. So uh, in this way, this um, is the main purpose that we're trying to um, propose this kind of metric. Of course, we can use that metric to do any classification models. Ideally, so here we just quickly summarize the, um, the results of the um, modeling for three cases we're having. So the first one is our example data, which is sort of like small data sets because we only have um, 10 to 20 trials for each subject. And we're basically, the, for the first case, there, are two, there is a hierarchical cluster because the first one, we need to know which task they're performing. And then for each task, we need to differentiate it to different movements. And here we just show the within task classification result, which is actually a binary classification. And this one we also compare with the popular used metric, the PSD, combined with the random forest. Well, there are different options um, because it's binary classification. So we have lots of choices, honestly. We also compare with um, deep learning models because we are trying to see how, um, if we just want to let the algorithms do it, to find the, in, um, the main, the metrics automatically can how it performs. And we noticed that the performance is not promising. Well, the main reason is that we don't have enough training data, although we already augmented the data, but still we have really limited data. So here, uh, and th that's why we actually do the second task, which is spatial task, which is also binary classification. We're trying to differentiate in long versus short distance. Understanding how people are honest, uh, like look at different locations is it far or, or, sh or close to us. So for this guy over here, we have a relatively more data, double the data size. So here we have, now we have a better performing deep learning models. And then compared with uh, the proposed methods, we are still doing a little bit better with a really um, efficient one because for deep learning models, we actually um, take more times and it doesn't probably, um, can be improved a little bit, but now we're actually using a shallow network. It's not that many parameters, but still it's time consuming a little bit. And for, we also look at the different models to see um, the important locations for different tasks. So um, do I run out of time? Hey, can, you, can, you, uh, can you wrap up soon? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Sorry about that. Swimming. Yeah, this is a quick um, results of the, um, the, CM, the CMP process. And the, um, there's like one last one is that we're also conducting some association analysis, which combined with the manifold learning to try to understand uh, how the connectivity are changing along with the different tasks. That's all, sorry about that, thank you. So let's move on to the next speaker, uh, uh, Adam uh, uh, Liu, uh, sorry if I pronounce his name, but, uh, uh, Adam from the George Washington University, and uh, he's going to talk about the multiple imputation in functional regression with application to EEG data in a depression study. Adam, can you share your screen? Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah, that's good. Okay, great. Okay, so first, um, I want to say thanks to uh, Ling Long for organizing this and, and Jian for, for chairing. I appreciate um, being part of this conference. I always like coming to it. Um, and I also want to thank the previous speaker, Jing Yi, because she talked a lot about um, the EEG, which is so I don't have to give much of a background on that, which is great. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been doing in developing some multiple imputation procedures to handle 
um, missing scalar and functional data in the context of fitting a functional regression model. And the application is to looking at group differences uh, in a particular measure that we derive from EEG known as frontal asymmetry. Um, and the di I'm looking at differences between um, depressed subjects and healthy controls. Um, so first I'll acknowledge my collaborators are Eva Petkova from NYU and Ofer Harrell from UConn. Um, and I'll acknowledge my uh, grant funding through K01. And I'll say that the details, I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details of the method, um, but there's a preprint available on archive that um, explains all of them. And we're working on what we hope is the last revision so that we could submit this and uh, get this published soon. So I'll just jump right into the, the motivation. As I said on the, um, the introductory slide, we're looking at trying to understand differences between healthy controls and depressed subjects with respect to an EEG measure that's known as frontal asymmetry, which I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide. But so in the previous uh, lecture, we heard a lot about what EEG data is, and I'm focusing particularly on EEG um, data that's been transformed to the frequency domain. So I've got a picture here on the right side of some what are called current source density curves that we can get from each electrode um, from each subject uh, in our study. Um, let me back up, I'll say our study is from, we're looking at uh, data from an antidepressant trial, um, but we're not focusing on the antidepressant piece. We're looking at the baseline data, which has information from 40 healthy controls and 295 depressed subjects. And we're analyzing their EEG data from uh, under a resting condition with their eyes closed. Um, so coming back to the power curves. So at each electrode, we get one of these CSD or current source density power curves. Um, we've got frequency on the x-axis horizontal axis, which is kind of a measure of um, the different types of rhythms of gross neuronal activity um, that are being observed. And on the y-axis, we've got power, which is basically saying, you know, what's the strength of the particular um, rhythm of firing that's um, the rhythm of firing for each um, for each frequency that can be observed. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a function of these curves um, that we'll talk about on the next slide is, is frontal asymmetry. But like Jingyi mentioned, a lot of times what happens is that if you're trying to make group comparisons using these EEG data, um, clinicians will just chunk these curves into different um, um, different bands. And so um, I'm calling about 48 hertz the theta band, 8 to about 16 hertz the alpha band, and 16 to 32 hertz the beta band. Um, and they'll look at like calculating average power over a particular range and then compare that average power between the depressed subjects and the non depressed subjects and see what comes out, like maybe doing a t test or some kind of a, a regression model with that average power as the, the response. We're thinking it might make more sense or we might learn a little bit more if we look at the entire um, domain of, of frequency values and the associated power values and kind of do a, a comparison using a functional model where the response is these current source density power curves or some function of them. So the particular um, measure from EEG that we're going to be looking at like I mentioned, is um, known as frontal asymmetry. And so frontal asymmetry is just going to take those CSD curves that we get from the EEG at the F4 and F3 electrodes. So these are at symmetric locations in the front of the scalp cap. And we're basically forming the pointwise difference between those CSD curves and dividing by the pointwise standard DV or the pointwise um, sum so that we could get what are called normalized frontal asymmetry measures at each of the frequency values. And we're focusing on the frequency values from uh, 4 to 31 hertz. So about the, the theta, alpha, and um, beta, beta bands. So here I've got plots of those frontal asymmetry curves in red for our healthy controls and in blue for our depressed subjects. And I further stratified that by um, gender, female at the top, male at the bottom. So most of the literature that looks at frontal asymmetry and tries to do these comparisons between depressed and healthy controls, it really just focuses on frontal asymmetry from the, the alpha band. Um, and it would be the average over that the the different frequency values in that alpha band. So here that would be represented by looking at the alpha band I'm calling from about eight to 16 Hertz. Um, so here, if I'm looking among healthy controls, female healthy controls, the average in that group corresponds to this black line, this black dotted line. 
Um, and it would be a comparison of that black dotted line value with the MDD subjects, uh, female MDD subjects. Um, so we wanted to consider the entire, that frontal asymmetry curve across all those frequency values. And we're asking, does frontal asymmetry differ between healthy controls and depressed subjects? And the results when you're just looking at frontal alpha asymmetry are pretty inconclusive. Um, Vanderveen et al. in 2017 did a nice review paper and a meta-analysis that looked at different studies um, that assessed frontal alpha asymmetry between depressed and healthy controls. And the results were kind of incom inconclusive. Some studies showed that, you know, MDD subjects had higher frontal alpha asymmetry. Others showed that the uh, controls had higher asymmetry and some just showed no, no effect at all. Um, but one of the criticisms of those um, those studies was that, well, one, they were pretty small studies and they didn't tend to control for important things like age and sex and handedness, like how strongly left or right handed you are or cognition. And so Vanderveen would argue that any studies of um, frontal asymmetry or frontal alpha asymmetry should account for these, these variables in the analysis. So we wanted to take, um, like I said, a functional data approach looking at differences in these frontal asymmetry curves and account for all those other important covariates. So we did something pretty simple. We fit a functional response model where we had those frontal asymmetry curves as the response, and we have a bunch of scalar values as predictors in our regression model. So we have age, EHI corresponds to Edinburgh handedness index, so a large negative values correspond to being um, dominantly left-handed, high positive values, or I think positive 100 corresponds to being dominantly right-handed. This uh, WASI V score is a Wechsler cognitive score, high values correspond to um, uh, good cognition. MDD is just the binary indicator for whether you have depression or you're in the healthy control group. Uh, sex is male, female. And then we also looked at interactions between um, sex and age and MDD. Um, and so we just, this is a pretty simple functional response model that we wanted to fit. And we were going to use kind of a, a CAN function in the refund package, which is a, a really great package in R for doing functional data analysis. Um, and one of the functions, the PFFR function allows you to fit um, this type of a model. It's called penalized function on function regression, but you can do it if you have just a function as the outcome and a bunch of scalars as the, um, the predictors. So we wanted to do this, but one wrinkle in this data set is that um, some of the data are missing for the cognition score, the SWASI V score, and for some of the EEG data. So uh, in our data set, we had 40 healthy controls and um, only 35 of those healthy controls had that cognitive, that cognition score, and only 22 had usable EEG data, or um, we could only compute frontal asymmetry curves for 22 of those subjects. One of them was just missing EEG data altogether, and 17 of them had quality control scores for their EEG data that was below kind of an acceptable level that we were, we, it was suggested to us that we probably shouldn't use anything that was scored as either marginal or unacceptable. So we have some missing data there. And then in the depressed subjects, we had 295 of those, um, 251 of them had a cognitive score available and only 214 of them had um, usable EEG data. So if we wanted to just um, go ahead and do a complete case analysis, we would need to throw out about 40% of our data set. And we didn't want to do that. So we kind of looked around to see if there were any uh, approaches available for um, imputation. And it turns out there, there's really nothing out there. And so we wanted just to kind of extend um, the MICE procedure to allow for functional and scalar data in the context of a functional regression. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, just go through without some of the um, nitty gritty details about what um, the imputation procedure is. So um, we know that when you're doing any kind of a multiple imputation analysis, there's three steps to it. First, you have to impute the data multiple times. So you get your uh, imputed data sets that are complete. Then you, the second step will be to fit your analysis model on each of those complete imputed data sets. And then you need some way to pool um, the information or the estimates that you get across those uh, multiply imputed data sets and then come up with a, a valid measure um, of variability for those um, estimates that you get, those pooled estimates that you get. So I'm just going to briefly talk about each one of these steps going forward. So first step, how do you impute the data? So we wanted a method that would be relatively automated and the MICE procedure is exactly that. And it's nice because you don't have to specify the joint distribution um, of the variables and the missingness. Um, you know, as you were thinking about 
uh, doing multiple imputation with functional data and scalar data combined, there's really conceptually no difference in terms of the missingness mechanisms and the, um, the implications of those missing mechanism, missingness mechanisms on valid inference. So we don't really have to um, overthink it there. The one thing that does need to change, obviously, is that the imputation models need to be um, tailored to the fact that you have both scalar and functional data. And so it's not kind of a, a crazy jump to do that. If you have um, scalar data that are missing, then you would fit a um, regression model. Your, your imputation model for those missing scalar values would be perhaps something like a, a scalar on function regression model where you have scalars and functions as your predictors. Um, so here, I know there's a lot of notation here. I'm just thinking about a scalar. I'm denoting my scalars as Zs. Um, and so any of the other scalars that are available to my data set, either that are going to be in my analytic model, or I can think of as auxiliary variables, I'll include those in my uh, some kind of a regression model for, for the response. If my response variable for in my main analytic model is a scalar, I'll just include it um, as well. And then if I have some functional covariates or functional auxiliary variables, I'll include them using a kind of a standard scalar on function um, linear model. Or here, I have to have options because if my if my response is also a function like it is in our application, it's the frontal asymmetry curves, I'll have to include that um, as a function um, kind of in the standard way. And so there's uh, lots of different approaches to use to um, come up with imputation models that are scalar on function. And we chose to use the PFR approach or penalized functional regression. It's built into the refund package. So we just kind of use that. Um, on the other hand, if your missing data type is um, functional, then you'll have to fit a type of model like we have as our actual uh, analytical model, a functional response model. And so I've got kind of similar setups here, and you could use something like penalized function on functional regression to estimate um, those types of models. And so just like the regular um, MICE algorithm, the, um, what we're calling the functional regression or FRAGMICE algorithm, um, the only difference here really is that we have these more tailored imputation models that allow for functional and, and, and scalar variables at the same time. But it's still an iterative procedure. Um, you have to deal with um, checking convergence, um, but otherwise it's pretty much the same as the standard MICE algorithm with just, just scalars. So now when it comes to convergence and diagnostics, um, there's really no clear cut method for determining when the MICE algorithm has converged. Um, but there's usually ad hoc approaches that are used like making convergence plots or um, what are known as strip plots to assess fidelity of the imputed data to the observed data. And so we just extended those um, from pure scalar data to looking at what they might be with um, with functional data. So I've got, so I ran, uh, so I did some multiple imputation with the healthy controls in our example. Uh, and I wanted to look at the, the convergence plots and the strip plots. So that's what these are here. So here's an example of a functional convergence plot where I'm plotting the pointwise mean of the imputed functional values for the healthy control subjects. So remember we were, we were missing, I think it was uh, 18 subjects worth of um, frontal asymmetry curves. Um, so here, each panel corresponds to one imputation stream or one stream or one imputed data sets. So I imputed 20 different data sets for these healthy controls. Um, there's different curves in each of these panels corresponding to the iteration number, like how many iterations of the MICE algorithm I ran um, for that particular data set. And the colors, the light colors correspond to earlier um, iterations and the dark colors correspond to later iterations. And so what you wanna see is we wanna kind of see some mixing or common, um, common patterns across the imputed data sets. And we wanna see the darker um, shaded uh, curves kind of coming to uh, kind of having a, a deeper a depth kind of going to the center of our, um, of the, the mean value, the, the pointwise mean curves um, across the, the iterations. So this is kind of analogous to a, um, a scalar convergence plot where you wanna see mixing of the streams for mean values or standard deviation values um, for the scalars. We could also make things like functional strip plots to see how the imputed values correspond to or look like the, um, the observed values. So here I'm plotting the observed um, functions, the observed frontal asymmetry curves in blue um, and the imputed ones in red across the 20 different data sets. 
So here, this first row shows the first 10 imputed data sets and the, impu the, the imputed um, frontal asymmetry curves uh, in each one. And you can compare those with the observes and you, you don't see anything that's really standing out. Maybe in this, this fifth imputed data set, you see one that's kind of getting out of the range of values that would be typical and maybe in this 14th one and 17th. So it gives a nice way to diagnose if maybe you need to go in there and adjust the values that look like they might not um, fit with you know, what the, the pattern that you should, you think you should be seeing. Uh, so, so that's how we would, you know, do the imputation and assess the convergence of the, um, of the procedure. The second step would be to now take those imputed data sets, fit your analysis model on each imputed data sets. In our motivating example, that would mean fitting the scalar response model um, on each of those. I imputed, uh, you'll see in the example, I imputed 20 different data sets. Um, and obviously there's a number of different options that are available for, for fitting those types of models, but we were gonna use the um, penalized function on function approach that's available through the refund package. And then the last thing that you need to do is since you have estimates from all those different imputed data sets, you need to combine them in some principled way. And so the typical way of doing that is to use what are known as Rubin's rules. So basically with scalar coefficient estimates, you're uh, essentially just, you're just averaging across the imputed data sets, the, um, the estimates that you have, and then you're computing the variance covariance matrix for those, um, those estimates in a way that accounts for both the within imputation variance and the between imputation variance. And so you're getting a total measure of variance that allows you to get standard errors and, and, and confidence intervals. Uh, it's really similar to do that with um, your functional estimates because we think about representing our functional, our unknown um, functional coefficients using some low dimensional basis. We really just have to estimate those basis coefficients. So we'll average the basis coefficient estimates, those unknown basis coefficient estimates across the imputed data sets. And in a similar way, we'll compute the variance covariance matrix for those estimates so that we'll be able to get the total variance. And then we can take that and then create things like confidence bands or pointless confidence bands around our, our estimates. All right, so let me just briefly show you a little simulation that we did um, so we simulated some scalar covariates um, of a binary uh, predictor and two correlated um, continuous predictors. And we generated functional responses um, so that they were associated with the scalar predictors according to these, this intercept and these slope functions. Uh, and then we, uh, we put in some missingness in the Z2 variable. This Z2 variable had missingness. We generated missingness, so it's missing at random. And we um, developed it so that we had 10% missingness, 20% missingness, 30% missingness in different settings. Um, we looked at um, generating data sets with sample sizes of 350. And then we compared a couple of different methods. There's really, there really are no methods out there for handling missing data in this functional regression context. So we, we looked at doing complete case analysis. We looked at mean imputation. And then we looked at our approach, this we're calling functional regression mice. Um, where we imputed five data sets. All of our imputation models and our analysis model were all specified correctly. We ran it for 20 iterations and we used Rubin's rules to pool the estimates. Um, and then we ran that 500 times. So here what we're looking at is um, point-wise standardized bias um, estimates for the coefficient functions that we wanted to estimate. So these, uh, the beta zero, beta one, beta two, beta three estimates. Um, and we're looking at the point-wise standardized bias across different amounts of missingness, 10% missingness, 20% missingness, 30% missingness. And the curve colors correspond to the different approaches that we, we looked at um, over the 500 simulated data sets. So the red curve is gonna correspond to the standardized point-wise bias for the case where we actually have no missing data because um, it was simulated, we were able to just fit the, fit the uh, analytic model with all the data available. So the, that's corresponding to this all no missing. Um, CCA or complete case analysis is the green dotted curves. Our functional regression uh, mice imputation procedure corresponds to the blue curves and the gold curves are what we get with mean imputation. And so you can see kind of overall the things that jump out to you are that mean imputation really pretty, does pretty poorly over uh, most of the scenarios. Um, large standardized bias um, across kind of the entire uh, domain. Uh, the next worst is maybe um, complete case analysis. These green curves are kind of consistently larger um, 
or greater magnitude standard or greater magnitude standardized bias than either um, our method or the all no missing method. And so our approach this frag mice, you know, if everything kind of specified correctly, it seems to be tracking nicely with the case where you've got actually no missing data. It's doing doing pretty well. Um, we can also look at 95% point wise confidence bands, coverage and width. And we could see, uh, so here I've got uh, along the first row, I've got coverage and in the bottom row I've got width. Um, so I know I'm running out of time. Say so we do pretty well with respect to coverage compared to um, the all no missing cases, uh, the all no, no missing um, case, and then also the, the width is pretty pretty decent. Okay, so let me finish up quickly, go back to the application. So remember, we're trying to fit this, um, this functional regression model, functional response model, um, looking at the association between depression, a status, and uh, frontal asymmetry. We have these missing data. So what we did was for maximal flexibility, we ended up doing our imputation separately in the healthy controls and the depressed subjects. We used a scalar on function uh, model to impute the, the cognition scores. We used um, penalized function on function regression to impute the frontal asymmetry um, curves, generated 20 imputed data sets, did 20 iterations within each data set and used Rubin's rules to combine. So these are the estimates that we got um, using complete case analysis, the estimates for the slope functions, complete case analysis estimates in red, our functional regression imputation estimates, the pooled estimates in green, and the mean imputations in blue. Uh, one thing that jumps out is that the confidence bands for the our, our approach are pretty wide, and that's due to the fact that we have um, only 22 pieces of information or 22 um, observations for the healthy controls with complete data, and so that's contributing to um, kind of the large standard errors around the, the estimates. But one thing we do also notice is that the our, our Fregmice imputation procedure estimates, they kind of track along with the complete case analysis estimates. Um, so it's giving us a sense that, you know, we could probably just use the complete case analysis and be okay here. Um, probably a more useful way to look at this is to look at the, um, uh, the uh, point-wise mean uh, estimates from the models. And so here we split it out by gender and by age. We've looked at a couple, three different age values. Um, a, kind of the one standard deviation below the mean age, which is 23.7, uh, mean age is just 37, and, and um, one standard deviation above, which is 50.62. And so we could see a couple of different things, like for females, healthy control subjects tend to have higher frontal asymmetry over most of the theta, alpha, and beta range. Um, but that difference diminishes as age increases. And it actually seems like that that association switches with older age so that the depressed subjects have higher um, frontal asymmetry values over uh, most of the, the beta and, and, and alpha, or the, sorry, the theta and alpha range. And it's a little bit different with males. Um, male healthy control subjects have higher frontal asymmetry at younger age, but the difference tends to persist, especially in the, the, the beta range. Um, but it, it looks like it switches in the, the theta band um, so that, again, the depressed subjects tend to have higher frontal asymmetry um, than the healthy controls um, for older subjects. And it looks like there's really maybe no difference in the alpha band. So summary, we just we proposed a, a, an approach for multiple mutation when we're doing this scalar and functional data analysis, we've extended Rubin's rules and we focus on using PFFR, but we'd like to maybe add flexibility into, we have, we have some code available, we're hopefully turning into a, a package. Um, so we wanna add some flexibility by incorporating other fitting methods. And there's kind of lots of different um, research questions that we have, like how can we handle complex or higher dimensional functional data? Could we use something or incorporate something like predictive mean matching um, into, into that procedure? So that's it, thanks. Due to the time, time limit, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Guan Chun Cao from the Auburn University. Uh, yeah, yeah, it has started. Uh, Thank you. Oh, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen, but I cannot hear you very well. Can you? Okay. <clears throat> okay, hi, I want. Um, can you hear me better? Okay, it's better. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the organizer and Dr. Kang uh, for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, session to allow us to uh, share our current work on functional data analysis via deep neural networks. 
Um, first, I would like to thank my collaborator, my current uh, PhD student, Shuo Yang Wang, and um, Dr. Uh, Zhuo Fengshang from New Jersey Institute of Technology, and also uh, the funding agency. Um, um, our motivating example is Alzheimer's disease, the brain imaging data set. Uh, we know that Alzheimer's disease is an irreversible progressive brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills. And so, um, and eventually the ability to carry out the simplest tasks like conversation with family members. And we know that it is the uh, um, sixth uh, leading cause of death in, in the United States. Um, so uh, the damage of this disease is, is initially appears to take place in the hippocampus and the part of the brain essentially in forming memories uh, as neuron dies uh, to the uh, mild uh, disease case stage. Um, as neuron dies, additional parts of the brain are affected. And by the final stage of the Alzheimer's, um, the damage is widespread and the brain tissues had shrunk significantly. So we can see that from the healthy brain and to the uh, later stage that the severe disease. And unfortunately, uh, the Alzheimer's has uh, no current appeal, um, but treatment for symptoms are available. Um, so although the current Alzheimer's treatment can now stop the disease from progressing, uh, they can temporarily slow the, pro uh, the worsening of dementia uh, symptom and improve the quality of um, the life for, for those who with the disease and also their caregivers. So now the key problem is how could we help the medical doctor to diagnose the disease at its early stage? Um, so currently, um, most uh, popular method is to, we are trying to use uh, amyloid imaging uh, with um, post-strong uh, emission tomography, the PET imaging, and it has uh, emerging uh, role in management of the Alzheimer's disease. So now typical the question for the medical doctor is when they have a bunch of those PET imaging from the patient or from the normal people, how could they tell the underlying true structure for, from those pictures? Uh, at different stage. Um, there are many, many methods working on the brain imaging studies and uh, trying to uh, analyze the imaging data from a different point of view. And uh, so thanks to the previous speaker, Adam, he also mentioned some uh, models on functional regression. Uh, so let me briefly introduce this um, models we use here. Um, we observe the data set is YIJ and I denote the I subject and J denote the repeated measurement for the I subject. Um, uh, the YJ can be uh, written as a true signal function F0, uh, which is mapping from the RD to R. Um, and so we assume the expectation of YJ go to the F0 at uh, point XJ. So for example, in the 2D imaging data set, the XJ can be viewed as the J's uh, pixel, uh, pixel, uh, pixels, and J is uh, from one to capital N, that's capital N is the number of uh, pixels for uh, each picture. And the second term is eta. Um, this characterizes the individual curve variation um, at point XJ, and the Y I here is uh, nothing but measurement arrows. So it has mean uh, zero. So here the N is the sample size and uh, uh, capital N is the number of observations for each subject. Uh, here we assume the XJ is belong to the RD. So the D can be uh, one, two, three, or any dimension here. Uh, <clears throat> so for the 2D uh, dimension, uh, the XJ represents the uh, pixel. Uh, and for the 3D, it can uh, denote as a voxel uh, point. Um, as we mentioned, it's functional data, so we also define the um, correlation among different xj and xj prime uh, as the covalent function between yj and yj prime. So we assume it has the uh, um, equalization and with eigenvalue lambda k is uh, non-increasing and all non-negative. Um, and so that's the typical assumption for the eigenvalue, they have finite summation. And uh, phi k here, um, Eigen functions, uh, it has uh, like the also normal basis in the L2 space. So that's our uh, model assumption for uh, 
the functional regression model. That's very simple. Uh, you can build as the uh, function regression without any covariate. So our major interest thing is how do we estimate the signal? Uh, that's the main that's the main function on um, F0. Uh, there are many, many uh, work uh, on those functional regression uh, since the functional data analysis proposed about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, there are two major um, techniques work on the functional regression to estimate the mean function. Uh, the first one is the non-parametric regression. So majority of this type of work is uh, focused on the one-dimensional functional data. So usually the axis belongs to the R, and for example, in the time domain. And the major idea for this uh, non-parametric regression is they will assume uh, the F0 can be expanded by some functions, some basis function, like kernel, local linear, or uh, baseline functions. Um, for the 2D uh, uh, data set, there are few work on um, non-parametric regression methods work on this. Um, recently, 2019, uh, Wang and her crossers, they proposed a biverse line method. So that's the same idea. They use the biverse line to do the basic expansion for this uh, F0 functions. Um, for the 3D imaging data, um, Wang and uh, their crossers in 2014, they con consider the functional linear regression models and they consider the uh, hybrid basis uh, uh, expansion for those uh, two mean functions. And now for those type of the non-parametric regression, uh, we have to worry about for different dimension, they will have different basis function. And uh, our question is, do they have a unified estimator? And how about uh, when we have like this more than three, uh, say spatial temporal data or any D um, cases. So, and also there's no, um, um, a clear answer for, for this type of the question. And also know that uh, in most of the case, uh, when D is large, the convergence rate for the estimator is decreasing. So it really depends on the dimension D. Uh, the second approach, a major approach is uh, they are using the functional principal component analysis. And also uh, most of work is focused on the 1D case. And for the 2D, um, LILA 2016, they propose um, um, FPCA method to handle uh, some function observed on the 2D domain. And uh, more recently, uh, Chen Zhang, they started the general D-dimensional domain by using the FPCA. But the problem is um, the, we know the number of eigenfunctions um, is a key point for this FPCA function uh, method. And the result is also sensitive to uh, how do we select the number of eigenfunctions. Uh, the, and also they assume the true function has the same um, eigen, eigenfunctions expansions uh, that's pre-assumed. So therefore, <clears throat> we are trying to think about whether we have an alternative method to do the um, estimation uh, can uh, somehow provide an, an interesting applications for the functional regression uh, models. Um, the method we are going to propose here that is to use the deep neural networks method. Um, deep learning is a very promising method, has uh, started uh, very well in machine learning and computer science and also data science domains. But from statistical point of view, its application and theoretical research is still in its um, infant stage. So there are not uh, many literatures to study how could we use uh, deep, learn, deep neural network method to do the estimation and how, uh, and how about their statistical property for those estimators. Uh, in 2005, uh, Rossi and their co-authors, his co-authors, they use um, some radio basis function networks and also multi-layer uh, perceptual models to study the functional data. Um, but they do not provide um, a theoretical results to justify their estimator. And also they only work on the one dimensional functional data. Uh, and moreover, they only consider the two layer neural network, not deep neural network. And uh, in the last year, uh, we have the, um, uh, Cindy and their author, they proposed some deep neural uh, network estimators for the 
functional linear regression model. Um, and they also study some, uh, try to study some properties from statistical point of view. Um, so, uh, but they do not provide the convergence rate for the estimators. And also they do not consider uh, um, multi-layer uh, cases. So um, let me briefly introduce the deep neural networks. And thanks to the um, first day workshop, uh, Dr. Hui Ling mentioned the uh, deep neural uh, deep learning method very well. So here I briefly mentioned the notations we are going to use later. Um, as we know that deep neural networks, we have many, many layers and in each layer is nothing but a linear combination uh, of the input values. They are, we are interested in the f of x and the first layer will be um, weight matrix w times x and plus a vector. This vector is called activation vector. And then outside we have put a nonlinear function. This is called the activation function sigma. And here we use the uh, popular activation function value. Uh, so here the W is the weight matrix. And then um, to the outside layer, we do the same thing. And one by one, finally, we will have the output layers. Uh, here, uh, we, in order to control and to avoid overfitting problems, we also assume some sparsity for the network space we are going to use. So basically we control the non-zero number or element of the weight matrix and uh, activation uh, vectors uh, V here. So here the L is the number of layers and the P uh, that um, denotes that the dimension for uh, each uh, weight matrix and S is the sparsity uh, we are going to put. Uh, we will have some assumption for the true mean functions um, let me briefly introduce some notation for uh, in order to introduce the uh, functional uh, the function space for the true mean function uh, f zero. Uh, so the gi here is a um, uh, function vector, and they um, have the mapping from uh, di dimension to the di plus one, and for each element is gi j, and j from one to di plus one, and each element the gi j is a uh, beta by holder functions and its uh, dimension is at most uh, ti. So the intrinsic dimension for the gij is ti and usually the ti is, we assume is less than the dimension p. So the true underlying function space consists of a composition structure of the, from the g0 to the gq. Um, and so the smoothness for the F function is depend on the uh, smooth, smoothness for each composition function from G0 to GQ. And we assume that uh, beta I stars that equal to the beta I, the i's order function smoothness and product uh, the beta K, K from I plus one to the last uh, function Q. <clears throat> so basically uh, we assume the true function has a composition structures Actually, it's not a strong assumption. Uh, it's a very mild uh, assumption for the function. For example, let me give you, a, give you an example. Suppose we have 3D uh, functions, uh, f0, um, x1, x2, and x3 has this exponential function. And inside of this function has the x1, x2, and plus sign function, and another log function. So uh, that means we have the um, input or um, the, fun, uh, the element is x1, x2, x3, and we will have the composition function, the product, the sign function, and also the log function. And then we add them um, time or pass them together. Outside, we have the uh, function, exponential function. So um, uh, remember that usually in the non-parametric, they will assume uh, like additive uh, models or uh, single index models such that they all are special case of the composition functions. So um, that's our assumption for the true mean functions. And now let's um, take a look at that. How could we do um, our estimation, proposed estimator on the F hat? So um, <clears throat> we are going to use the empirical risk uh, uh, function to, uh, to select our, to estimate our best uh, um, uh, estimator F hat. 
So basically, we do the argument, and we first take the uh, y i across all the subject. So the y bar dot j here is at j's point or j's observation location. We take average across all the observation point y i. And then we are trying to minimize this uh, least square problems to find the best uh, um, function uh, f. So f belongs to the function, uh, uh, the deep neural network function space we just mentioned before. Uh, so for example, here, when we have 2D imaging data, um, the D is 2, our input layer will be on xj1 and xj2 and j from 1 to n. And our output layer will be the average um, um, y bar dot j. So that's the average. So that will be our input and output. And then give, given the data set, we can train the neural network. And then find our uh, best, uh, our uh, proposed estimator at uh, f hat. Um, and we also show that our proposed estimator f hat, uh, based on the deep neural network structure, has a very good uh, non asymptotic convergency rate. So uh, let's take a look at this rate. We can show that uh, with probability equals to one, uh, the empirical um, n norm. Uh, <clears throat> The empirical um, uh, empirical norm of f hat um, minus f zero converge to zero. So actually, the convergence rate here, uh, if we um, uh, if we focus on the leading term, that's the small n capital n to the power of zero rho, and uh, negative theta over theta plus one. So this term is actually we can see that the rate depends on the sample size, depends on how many observations for each subject. Um, here, the very row is a constant, um, is bigger or equal to zero. And the theta here is only depends on the true function space. And keep in mind that theta does not depend on the uh, dimension d here. And for the special case, if rho is zero, uh, the very row is zero, that means we uh, do not have repeat measurement. Uh, the n zero is one. So uh, it's uh, so functional data becomes the ID data. So the sample size uh, n to the power of theta over theta plus one, this convergence rate is can achieve the um, optimal non-parametric rate. So if we ignore the log term here. So it's a very exciting result. Uh, like we can find a convergence rate uh, for the deep neural network estimator. And also for the computation, we have uh, provided our R package, and you are welcome to um, try our package from the GitHub website. Um, let me show you some numerical uh, results. Uh, we uh, conduct our uh, simulation result and compare with um, uh, diverse fine smoothing method that we mentioned before for the um, two-dimensional uh, cases. This is our true mean function, F0, and this will be our uh, DN method uh, estimators, and this is diverse fine estimator. So um, they are quite similar, and we have very uh, uh, comparable results. And also, this is L2 risk and standard deviation. Uh, I would say that uh, they will have very uh, similar result compared to the diverse fine. And also keep in mind that Bavar's spline, they also could achieve the optimal convergence rate. So uh, even if we have the log term in our convergence rate, we can still uh, have similar results in terms of uh, L2 risk and standard deviation. And for the 3D case, uh, we also provide our simulation result. And this is F0 and F, uh, FDN hat. So, uh, see a very nice result and this will be the L2 uh, risk and standard deviation. So when the sample size increasing, the risk is decreasing. So uh, it supports our uh, theoretical result. Um, that will be the, in order to see the uh, simulation result more carefully, uh, we also uh, slice, uh, cut our 3D um, um, uh, data into uh, 2D case. So we can Take a look at the uh, comparison at each slice with the true mean function and also the estimator. Okay. 
Hmm. Okay, so now let's back to our uh, motivating example. As we mentioned, this method could apply to the 2D and 3D imaging data. Uh, so uh, our uh, real data coming from the ADNI, uh, that's Alzheimer's Disease Neural Imaging Initiative data set. And we collected 79 patients from the Alzheimer's disease group and with uh, about 33 females and 46 uh, males. And all those data uh, for each patient have uh, been reoriented into 79 by 95 by 90, uh, 69 uh, voxels. So that means each patient has uh, 69 slash the 2D imaging. And for each 2D imaging it has a voxel number, uh, pixel number is uh, 79 by 95. Uh, so we first, as we mentioned, our method, is we are going to first take the average of course the subject. Um, so uh, we just pick up uh, three different um, slides to do the comparison. So we pick up 20s, 40s, and 60s slides from the uh, 3D cases. So we first recover their 2D scans by taking the uh, by first taking the average. So that's how we get the y bar. And then that will be our estimated y hat at each location. And also uh, we can, as we mentioned, we can recover the true mean function. So we can also increase in the, uh, uh, the resolutions from uh, the original data set is 79 by 95 to 180 by uh, 128 by uh, 128. So that's the 2D case. And uh, we also can recover um, the imaging data from the 3D case I mentioned. So uh, for the 3D case, we also first take the average at the same locations, and uh, and then we can also recover the app hatch given the axis 3D. So that is we uh, increasing the resolution to the higher case, and that's our um, recovered imaging. So because 3D, so in order to show the picture clearly, we just show several um, locations with different slides. Okay, so let me uh, wrap up our um, uh, results very quickly. Uh, so we propose the deep neural network based estimator, and it can achieve uh, empirical uh, coverage. And we have shown the empirical coverage convert to zero, and it's free from the dimension D. Uh, it can recover a signal for the multi-dimensional functional data uh, with application on the 2D and 3D imaging data. Uh, and maybe we can consider some uh, higher um, higher dimensional case, for example, spatial temporal data as a future research work. Um, it is a unified estimator. Uh, it can work for any dimensional functional data. And because we do not assume any additional or very complicated structure for the tuning function, uh, we believe it has broader and more flexible applications in different domains. Okay, so uh, if you are interested in our technical details, you are welcome to take a look at our manuscript on the archive and try our R package. And thank you.